All right, let's start. Hello, everybody. Sorry I had to meet by Zoom, not my favorite, especially on one of my favorite topics. So being be engaged, be, uh, be on mute until you want to jump in, but you're you're probably better off getting off of mute and interrupting me than doing chat. I'll try to keep up with chat. It's a little tough for me to do chat while I'm also trying to do Zoom, but just interrupt me. We've got an incredible topic. It's one of my favorite topics. Hopefully we'll be back on campus on Thursday because I really want to show you all some, some, I think, some of the most interesting parts of risk management when you look at academia versus what's actually done in practice. And it's related to this topic. So let's let's just review real quickly what we did last time. And we'll do this again with a separate problem. But we have this bank and we're trying to calculate the duration or net worth. So we use this formula. We had to figure out the duration of assets. That's pretty simple. We discovered the duration of net worth was 6.43 years. It's a positive number. It can be negative, but it's positive here. And we found that that's out of, out of whack because their bank says their net duration net worth has to be between negative five years and positive five years. So when rates fall, if you have negative duration net worth, your, your net worth would fall. So you can't fall more than 5% with 100 basis points. If, you've, if you have a positive, if rates rise and you have a, a positive five year duration, then you'd lose 5%, but they're actually 6.43%. So they're out, of, they're out of whack. And so we try to figure out, okay, what do they need to do? So if the duration was, it's too high in this case. In that case, you have to reduce the duration of assets and increase the duration of liabilities. All right, so now we're doing the swap and you saw the swap. And if you look at the swap, AAA borrowed at Treasury plus 125 fixed for five years. So they've got that fixed. Triple B borrowed at floating at LIBOR plus uh, 20. And there's nothing unusual about that, just that's where they, they normally borrow. And then they do the swap where AAA pays LIBOR to triple B, triple B plays treasuries plus 140 to AAA. You do the math and you quickly notice that they both save 25 basis points off of what they would have paid if they borrowed in, in the floating rate for AAA and the fixed rate for triple B. So now the question is, which part of the swap with this bank we were just looking at. Remember the duration of the net worth was too high. So here's something that's, I think is confusing. I think there's a lot of a uh, habit and just kind of the normal way things are thought about, but this is the way I was trained. I'm not so sure you'd see this at every bank, but when I'm doing a swap at a bank, I think about the swap as changing the duration of my liabilities. When I look at a swap for a pension plan, I view it as the swaps changing the duration of my assets. I don't know why that's the case, but it's just the way it's always been, um, at least in all the examples I've seen. So I can't say everybody does it like that. So in this case, remember, so this is really the trick, I think, to this question, is before you get into the swap question, even before you even just do the basic numbers at the beginning, look at what they need to, what they need to do they need to increase the duration of liabilities. So we're gonna focus on the liabilities. How do you increase the duration of liabilities? Well, you start off in floating, but you end up in fixed. So we wanna be in a transaction where they initially were borrowing floating rate, but they ended up borrowing fixed rate, all right? So if we look at the swap, uh, So here's the swap. So if you go back and look at the original one, triple B started off floating, but they ended up fixed. If you start off borrowing floating and then you do an interest rate swap and you end up with fixed, you're increasing the duration of your liabilities. So in this particular case, since this bank needed to either reduce the duration of assets or increase the duration of liabilities, they should be on triple B's side of the swap. So 
here's the question. So here, here we did, here we did the swap. We did that last class. I'm skipping question three for right now. So we went back to the bank in the previous question. Their duration of net worth was 6.43 years. And that was too high. It should have been five or lower. So they need to either reduce the duration of assets or increase the duration of, of liabilities. And so they want to be on triple B side because triple B started with floating and ended up with fixed, thus increasing duration of liabilities and thus reducing the duration of net worth. All right. Now, there are things I count off for, which are, which are just, it's just sloppy writing. So I have students say they need to reduce net worth. Someone's not on mute, so if y'all can make sure you're all on mute, if you're, unless you're asking a question. Take some granny mustard. All the way down. I'll just wait, I can mute everybody, but I, I, I can't find that button right now. So someone's not on mute. It's good. It's good. It's it was 79 degrees just the other day, and now it's not. All right. Sorry, guys. Just a second. So it's poured on, get the fingernails pulled off again. Now comes the pastrami. You want to do like a, a decent amount. Like that. So a couple pieces on each. A bite for a maker. Because, okay. It just seems so sad. Sorry about that. Someone's not paying attention to the class, obviously, because they're not hearing me. So hopefully everybody's paying attention. This isn't a uh, catch up on social media time. So hopefully, plus this is the most exciting part of finance. So you, you kind of all really into it. All right. So sorry about that. All right. So I have students say this bank needs to reduce their net worth. That's not correct. They need to reduce the duration. Ah, sorry. Got distracted there ration of net worth by increasing, not increasing liabilities, increasing the duration of liabilities. All right, y'all see the distinction there. So some students write, hey, they need to reduce their net worth. Just And the reason I think that's so important not to say that is that doesn't make any sense. And students says, oh, well, I just left out a word. Well, but you just said something that would just be a ridiculous thing for any bank. No bank's going to say we need to reduce our net worth. So it's very important, very precise with the language to make sure you're very precise with the understanding and also so that you don't sound strange in an interview. So they need to reduce the duration of their net worth by increasing the duration of their liabilities. All right. We'll do another example so you get a little more practice on that, but very, very important that you're very precise in the language, mainly because you want to be you want to be very precise in the understanding. So let's look at the third question. Now it looked magical, and I call it magic. Both triple A and triple B end up 25 basis points cheaper than they would have been if they just borrowed directly. If triple B had just borrowed directly in the treasury market, they would have paid treasuries plus 185. Instead, they're only going to pay Treasury plus 160 and AAA is paying LIBOR minus 15 instead of LIBOR plus 10. That just seems too good to be true. It seems magical. So is there any downside to this? And people do use the word arbitrage. They look at a transaction like this and they may call it interest rate swap and arbitrage. The word arbitrage means gain without any risk. Well, this, this is not really arbitrage. And the reason it's not is, yes, you're reducing your interest rate risk, but you're replacing it with another risk called counterparty risk. Counterparty risk is a really good word to put into your search for your bank for paper one. It's, it's credit risk, and I told you not to talk about credit risk, but it is related to how they manage the interest rate risk. So essentially, to reduce interest rate risk, you have to pick up this counterparty risk. So counterparty risk is the risk that when the swap is paying you, the counterparty goes insolvent. We talked about this some last class, um, and I have more de details in the notes, but that's the real key. Interest rate swap arbitrage, even the people who use that, ter use that term know it's not a precise term. It's not truly arbitrage. There is risk here. Um, and if you think about in 2008, especially the, the swap dealers like Lehman Brothers, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, 
I mean, there were some pretty shaky organizations doing swaps. And if you think about uh, AIG doing credit default swaps, you know, they're, you're very concerned about the other side because they they owe you money and you think you're hedged and you're gonna get this wonderful payoff. And if they can't pay you, you're you're gonna stand in line with all of the all of all of the creditors. You do get you do get significant collateral. The collateral might be 102. So if they owe you 100 million right now, then they're gonna put aside 102 million dollars. But that's today. And if you think back, we talked about this some last class in 2008, that Lehman Brothers weekend. If that had gone bad, your market value on Friday versus Monday would have been radically different. And you may not have all that collateral you need if Lehman's essentially bankrupt on Monday and you have a swap contract with Lehman. So this is something you have to really, really manage. We may talk a little bit more about it because of this, the situation I have with my particular swap. And I'll talk about how I propose. They didn't follow my, my recommendation but how I propose to actually manage that counterparty risk. Um, when, we, when we talk about value at risk a little later, the main way you calculate counterparty risk is value at risk. It's, it's a scenario. So you don't say how much do they owe us right now because that can change overnight. What you're gonna ask is how much could they reasonably owe us in a short period of time such that that's my true exposure to them. And that's that's really a statistical calculation. It's not. You know, it's not the actual what they owe you right now because that's that can change so quickly. Very different than than credit risk. Credit risk, if someone owes you $100 million, they owe you $100 million. And that's, you know, they may owe you interest and may compound, you know, those kind of things. But it's not going to radically change from $100 million to $500 million just overnight. So counterparty risk is a very unique risk. Your bank's probably right. I, I would encourage you to go in and read what your banks are saying about counterparty risk, because I think you'd find it very fascinating. It's a very important concept. That's where the net, the, the master netting arrangements come in. It's related to counterparty risk. So it's it's a huge issue for these banks because they do a lot of this and pretty sizable transactions as well. So it's, it's, it's a huge issue. It may not seem that big of a deal, but for these banks, when you have billions and billions and billions of dollars in this and you have recessions like we might have coming up here, they really have to watch that that part of the business. All right, we just um, finish this section here. So if the duration of net worth is too high, either decrease the duration of assets or increase the duration of liability. That's the one we just did. For the swap, we're assuming we're on the liability side. We want to decrease the duration of liability, so we want to swap from floating to fix. That's what triple B's did. If it's the other way around, if the duration of net worth, not net worth, but the duration of net worth is too low, so maybe it's negative seven or negative eight, then you want to either increase the duration of assets or decrease the duration of liabilities. In that case, you want to decrease the duration of liabilities by swapping, swapping from fixed to floating. That would have been triple A side of it. This is where you really have to understand the swap and bring it all together. Comments or questions up to that point? You can unmute yourself, I think, can't you? You said uh, yeah. that there's other additional practices for these, sir. Is that right? Well, we're gonna do one right after this problem. There's another one and then there's, there's other practice ones out there. In fact, um, we'll probably, Maybe not Thursday, maybe next Tuesday class, I'll give you the actual problem from last year straight from the exam so you can get a new new one to practice and then we'll do it in class and then you'll have that on the class video. So you, you'll have two or three or four of them. Uh, they're not that different. You just, you know, it's really, you can practice the same problem and it's just a matter of plugging numbers into the formula. Hey, Professor, quick question. You said that um, the counterparty Rick was... Counterparty risk was the main risk associated with a swap. Is that the only risk associated with it, or would you just? Well, it there's some the basis risk. risk. We're gonna we're gonna talk about basis risk, and, and you'll see that when we do the pension plan. So um, swaps are not. You know, banks have very specific types of assets and liabilities. Swaps are a very specific type of security. Yeah, there's sensitive interest rates rising and falling. But you might expect them to rise and fall 
but they may actually do six in this market and four in this market. So you have the basis risks where you're expecting a swap to exactly offset just because a swap is a different security. I mean, a good example is swap spreads have in the, um, in the 90s, swap spreads gapped out really, really wide. So there's that risk. And then when the U.S. was debating uh, the last time we had this, uh, the debt ceiling debate, swap spreads actually went below negative to treasuries. So that's a basis risk that tends to be fairly small, not nearly as big as counterparty risk, but those are the two main ones. You have the basis risk and you have the counterparty risk. Uh, but I'm going to show you, I think that was Carlos, I think. I'm, I'm going to show you the basis risk in a pretty dramatic way uh, when I show you what happened in the state's pension plan. Awesome. Thanks, Professor. All right, let's do one last thing on the problem and then we'll do an entire other problem. So this is not really related to the banks. Banks don't do this. This is more pension plans, but we can apply it to a bank. And what it's called is dollar duration gap analysis. And what we're going to do here is our goal is to get the duration of net worth precisely to zero. So theoretically, we are not exposed to rates rising or falling. So that's that's our goal, absolute perfection. Um, so banks don't do this because they actually want to actually bet a little bit on interest rates, not a, a dramatically, but a little bit. Pension plans really like just get rid of the interest rate risk. So it's a very simple, in fact, almost this is a question almost all students get. In fact, some students bomb certain parts of this question. This is the one thing they get right. So it's a fairly straightforward. So the way dollar duration gap analysis works, if you, you take the duration of assets times how much you had in assets minus the duration of liabilities times the value you had in liabilities, that gives your dollar duration gap. So in our case, if you go back up there, our duration of assets was 4.42. We had a billion dollars in assets. The duration of liabilities was 375. We had 750 there. That gives you 1,607. If there's a swap out there with a duration of five years, then we need a swap of 321.5 million. And if we do that, 325, 321.5, and we swap from floating to fix, the duration of the bank's net worth would go exactly to zero. You can, you can try it out and test it. it. It absolutely works, but it's a very precise calculation. So, this is what I was saying in my conversation when I called my broker to do a swap. It's a very short conversation. I know the duration and dollar amount of my assets. I know the duration and dollar amount of my liabilities. I do this function. I call the bank and say my dollar gap is 1.6 billion. He or she says, well, I got a swap that's a 10 year duration. Well, great. I need 160 million. All right. It's very, very straightforward. And it works very precisely. So that's dollar duration. Now, this is the notional. I don't think we've talked about notional amount. I don't know how familiar, hopefully you've had notional amount, but let's let's talk notional amount in here because it's a very important concept. So here, AAA is borrowing fix at T plus 125. We don't know how much that is. Maybe it's $500 million, maybe it's a billion. They're just borrowing money. So when they borrow money, if they borrow 500 million, they get $500 million. And then they pay T plus 125 for five years. At the end of five years, they repay that $500 million. Triple B borrows $500 million. They pay LIBOR plus 20. And as interest rates change, that changes. And at the end of the time, they pay back the $500 million. The swap, all you're swapping on the swap is the interest rates. There's no principal. But you need the principal amount so you know what to apply the interest rates to. And that's what we call the notional amount. So if they do that 20, 321 million, they would enter a swap that has a notional amount of 321 million. They would never receive the 321. They would never repay the 321. But the T plus 140 fixed for five years would be put based on that. The LIBOR, which is going to change every time LIBOR changes, would be faced based on that. And they'll, they'll just swap that. So you need that notional amount. The notional amounts out there are scary numbers. They're like multiple times the size of the world economy. 
it's just massive, massive numbers. Some people worry about that. It just seems like, wow, there's that's that's a disaster about to happen. But it's a little exaggerated. But it's it is a massive, multi, multi trillion, maybe over a hundred trillion dollars in in value, just because um, you know there's kind of offsetting transactions. So it's a little bit of double counting. So that's what notional amount is. If I didn't explain that well, you know, you could definitely uh, Wikipedia that and just see what notional amount means. We use that term with with all types of derivatives, with swaps, with options, with forwards, with futures. You don't change, you know, with the swap. When you enter a swap, there's no money changes hands. The, the initial market value is zero. That's the way they're priced. So the notion amount and market value are not the same. When I entered my first swap, that day I entered it, its market value was zero. And then as interest rates changed, I had gains and losses based on my notion amount and based on my duration. My market value changed, but the notional just tells you what your exposure is to those interest rates, but you don't actually ever pay that. So the accountants don't really set up the notional amount anywhere. It's not something they're interested in. In fact, this is somewhat challenging. The first swap I did, the accountants weren't exactly sure what to do because I just did a transaction where there is no money changing hands. There is no market value. They're like, what entry do we do? So they, they had to figure that out. They had never done a transaction like that. But after I did it the first day, you might have a $5 million gain, $5 million gain, $5 million loss. That they have to account for. So they got to make sure they know about it so they know to account for that market value. Otherwise, you'd have a transaction going on and no one's recording it and it would be a pretty disastrous from an accounting standpoint. All right, the entire problem. Let's step back and think about what we did so that you can, right now, you're probably a little confused because we did it so fast. So let's, let's think about this in a step function. So you're given a bank balance sheet so what are you going to do? Well, the first thing you do is you calculate the duration of net worth using that formula. The duration of assets. Well, you can see it in those duration of assets minus liabilities over assets times the duration of liabilities, all of that times uh, assets over net worth. You can see that in the class notes. You just have to know that formula. It's a very easy formula, so I'm not asking you to do that formula. Duration of assets minus the dollar amount of liabilities divided by the dollar amount of assets times the duration of liabilities. All of that by assets over liabilities. What the dollar duration gap analysis is doing is getting this inside the parentheses to exactly equal zero. So that's the first step you do. Get the duration of net worth. Then you assess against the board policy and decide if duration of net worth is too high. So you need to increase duration of liabilities are too low. By too low, I mean too negative. Because too low, don't think of too low as one or two, because the closer you get to zero, the more protected you are. So by too low, I don't mean one or negative one, I mean negative seven. So too high might be positive seven, too low would be negative seven. All right? And there you want to reduce the duration of liabilities. The next thing you do is you set up a swap. So that's where you're going to look and see you know, who has the competitive advantage, comparative advantage, excuse me, comparative advantage and fixed. Almost always going to be AAA because of the term structure of credit spreads. Higher quality companies are almost always more favored in fixed than they are in floating. Set up the swap. The swap's given to you. If you messed up the first question, your swap's going to end up with two T's or two L's. So you do that, you then assess which side a swap accomplishes number two, and then you're going to do the dollar duration gap analysis. That's, that's the question 
in a nutshell, it's it's actually pretty straightforward. It's not a really overly complicated problem. The math is very simple. And I ask you the questions very much like I have in the notes. So I don't just give you the give you the data and tell you, you know, work this problem. I'll say calculate the duration of the assets, calculate the duration of the net worth. How did I do versus policy? I'm somewhat leading you through the problem. I'll say which which entity has the comparative advantage in fixed. And then here's the swap, calculate the swap. And then go back and see which side this could be on. And then you got the dollar duration gap analysis. So that's why it looks on the exam. It's very much in that order. So let's work another problem unless you have questions now. So let's let's think through this. Um, no questions. So in this one, the bank has loans of 900 with a duration of 3.3. That's a more logical duration than the previous bank. Use duration is very long. So that's, that's a little long for an auto loan, but maybe they have some other things going on. And then they have a lot of cash or whatever, um, just shorter term assets. And then their debt has a duration of 3.9 years. So the first thing we do is calculate the duration of their net worth. First of all, we got to figure out the duration of assets. So it's going to be 200 over 1100 times zero, but we can ignore that because that's going to be zero. So it's really just going to be 900 divided by 1100 times 3.3. So the duration of our assets is 2.7. So you notice here, the duration of assets is shorter than the duration of liabilities. Now to be perfectly in balance, you have to have that happen because you have less in liabilities than you do in assets. But the problem here is the duration of assets is too much shorter than the duration of liabilities. They get a duration of net worth of negative 4.91. So we just work that through the problem. So 2.7, that's the duration of assets, minus 950 liabilities over 1100, that's their assets times the 3.9. And multiply that by the leverage, 1,101 over 150, and that gives you negative 4.91. Well, what happened to the net worth interest rates for the rise 200 basis points? Well, normally interest rates rising is a bad thing, but not if your duration is negative. So this is another formula. You should already know this formula, so I'm not asking you to learn anything new here. Every finance student knows this formula. So minus duration times the change in yield, or minus, minus, I actually write them both. I put the minus and then I put this in here. If it's a plus or minus, I just write it out. I'm very careful. Times the change in yield. And I put, I always put minuses and plus signs so I'm real clear. So if interest rates were to rise to basis points, their net worth would actually go up 9.82%. Now, here's one thing, take clear notes on this. A lot of students think this question number two has to do something um, with the, the board's uh, policy. I don't have the board's policy in here, but this question, the only reason I ask this question is to make sure you know this formula. It's not related to any other part of the question. So make sure you're aware of that. We'll get more practice on that when we work other problems. I'm just asking you this just to make sure you know this, this formula, minus duration times and change in yield. It's such a critically important one. If we want to immunize the balance sheet, so immunize the balance sheet, all that means is you want to move the duration of net worth closer to zero. So if it's negative, you want it to be less negative. If it's positive, you want it to be less positive. So we want to immunize the balance sheet. We need to raise the duration of net worth by decreasing the duration of liabilities. The exact opposite of the previous one. Remember the previous one, we increased the duration of liabilities because our duration was too high. So how do we decrease the duration of liabilities? We would start by borrowing fix and then swap in the floating. In the previous question, that was AAA, but we'll see here. All right. So, all right. So here's the swap. AAA can borrow at T plus 50, B can borrow at T plus 150. On floating rate, AAA borrows at LIBOR plus 
triple B at log root plus 150. So you put the difference over here. So the difference here, 150 minus 50 is 100. On LIBOR, 160 minus 10 is 150. So this one is backwards. This is the abnormal one. Normally, fixed will be the bigger difference will be on fixed. So I just threw this out one and very unusual. You'd unlikely, it'd be very unlikely to see this actual problem. Uh, but just so we have some, some understanding. So wherever the number is bigger, that's where triple A has the comparator, comparative advantage. Wherever the number is smaller, that's where triple B has the advantage. Someone was asking me after last class that, wow, that just doesn't make sense. The whole idea of comparative advantage is, is a tough concept, but if you're not comfortable with that, just memorize that. Wherever, write this in your notes, wherever the number is bigger, that's where triple A has the advantage. Wherever the number is smaller, that's where triple B has the advantage. So in this case, we're asking who has the advantage in fixed rate, where here's fixed rate, the smaller number, is on fixed rate, so triple B has the compared advantage on fixed rate. Questions on that? Because some people really, really get kind of get messed up on that part. And if you mess up on that part, question two is really gonna get messed up. You know, when I grade, I, I don't like errors that keep flowing through. You know, if you make a mistake, I'll adjust for it. But here's one, if you mess up number one, it's really hard for me to give you partial credit because it's just the whole question is gonna get messed up. In fact, my only reason for asking question number one is to make sure you set up the swap correctly. All right, so um, question uh, two. Mr. Sweet, uh -huh. I was going to ask, so uh, on the last problem that you just did, uh, triple B has the advantage, right? On fixed rate. Yeah, oh, okay. The comparative advantage, all right? So triple A has the absolute advantage in both. They're cheaper in both. Triple A has the comparative advantage on floating rate. Triple B has the comparative advantage on fixed rate. All right. Okay. So I wouldn't even just use the word advantage. There's absolute advantage. Triple A is cheaper on both. Comparative advantage. Triple A has the advantage. Comparative advantage on floating. Triple B has comparative advantage on fixed. The exact opposite of the previous problem. And, and you're unlikely to see this one because it's just it's, it just seems awkward to me. It just doesn't seem normal. All right, so the ultimate borrowing cost. So AAA is going to borrow where they have the advantage, which is in floating. So they're going to borrow at LIBOR plus 10. B is going to borrow where they have the advantage, which is fixed. So they're going to borrow at T plus 150. And then they're going to do a swap. So AAA is going to pay T plus 15 to B. And triple B is going to pay LIBOR to A. And that's the way it works on these swaps. Well, LIBOR is gone now. So it's whatever that thing I showed y'all last class. Uh, that's past my retirement age. Uh, but that floating, everybody, that's what everybody does for the floating. So that's that's the number. And then the swaps curve on the fix can move around. That's the part that can move around. So the floating, so triple B is going to play pay LIBOR over to triple A, and triple A is going to pay whatever the swap spread is for five years. So right now it's treasuries plus 15. So triple A is going to pay treasuries plus 15 over to triple B. And it doesn't matter that triple A is more highly rated than triple B. That's the swap spread. That's I mean, that's the swaps curve. That's what you pay. So when we set that up, triple A pays T plus 15. So look at way I have it set up. They pay L, they pay 10 in the normal markets. And then you get to the swap, they pay T, they pay 15, and they receive L. So you take L minus L, that disappears. You take T plus 25, they're going to pay T plus 25. Triple B is going to pay T and they're going to pay 150. They're going to pay L, they're going to receive T and they're going to receive 15. So the T's are going to dis disappear. So you end up with L plus 135. If you look back at both of them, again, I, I should have used different numbers, but here the you take 150 minus 100, you're looking at the, the difference in the difference, that's 25. If I split that between the two of them, then the ultimate borrowing cost, T, instead of paying T plus 50, they pay T plus 25. Instead of paying L plus 160, 
you're going to pay L plus 135. So you essentially know the answer because it's just the way I set up the problem. You know the answer even before you start it. It's, it's going to, you know, you can somewhat look at it. I still want you to set it up. I think I have this one on the swap. Let's see if I did this one. So yeah, this is how this sets up. So here they borrow on normal markets. Triple A borrows at L plus 10, triple B at T plus 150. Triple B pays L over to triple A, triple A pays T plus 15. This might be $500 million in debt. This is gonna be whatever the swap is. Remember, we don't know the amount of the notional because we don't know what the duration of the actual swap is. So just because they borrow $500 million here doesn't mean the swap has to be $500 million. A swap is whatever you need to get the duration you want. If you buy a five-year duration swap, that's gonna give you a number that's twice as big as, than as if you buy a, a 10-year duration swap, all right? That notional amount, whatever it is, never switches hands, but it defines what payments they're gonna make. And so there it is all laid out. So we know they need to increase, they need to, I mean, reduce the duration of liabilities. They need to increase the duration of net worth, decrease the duration of liabilities. So they need to start fixed and end up floating. And again, it's triple B, it just happened to work out to be triple B this time, just because I, I switched the rates around. The answer is not always gonna be triple B, the triple B starts off borrowing fixed and they ended up borrowing floating. And if they do that, they're gonna reduce the duration of liabilities, which is going to increase the duration of net worth, moving from that negative four to something closer to zero. How do y'all feel on the swap? Y'all seen that? I'm not hearing any questions, so, okay. So they need to be on the triple B side so that they not decrease liabilities, but decrease the duration of liabilities in order to not increase net worth, but to increase the duration of net worth. Swapping from fixed to floating, you wanna be on that side of the transaction. And then the dollar duration gap analysis, the easy one, remember the duration of assets was 2.7. They had 1 billion, 100 million in assets. Duration of liabilities was 3.9, 9.50. I just typed this as an absolute value because we already know we want to swap from fix to floating. So we've already done that. We just have to say how much. So you can just put this in absolute terms. So the difference is 7.35. If the swap has a 10 year duration, you just take 7.35 divided by 10 and they need a notional amount of 73.5, and that's what they would tell their swap dealer. So essentially, you call your swap dealer, you know your dollar duration gap is 735. Your swap dealer says, hey, I've got, I, I really like what's, what the swaps curve is doing at 10 years duration. And you say, okay, well, get, I need 73.5 notional going from fixed to floating. And you're done. I mean, it's, it's it could be a 15 second, conversation, you might even just email it to them. So is this interest rate swap arbitrage where you talked about that? You know, you're picking up counterparty and that counterparty risk changes over time as interest rates change. So it's it's more of a theoretical number. The actual number they owe you right now can change in a, in a second, in a few seconds. Now, what if you owe the counterparty? So instead of them owing you $100 million, you owe them $100 million. Does that mean there's no counterparty risk? No, it doesn't because interest rates can change dramatically and quickly and the whole thing can shift. You, you can lose a lot of money pretty fast. I've seen swaps move $50, $100 million really, really fast. It, it, it really is, especially in a crisis like 2008, it can move really, really fast. So how do we measure counterparty risk? It's scenario analysis. It's something called, this is a good term you could look up. It's called, if you just type swap potential exposure or counterparty ex potential exposure, because counterparty risk, unlike debt, can shift up and down. You wanna know what's your true exposure to this firm. It might be a one in a hundred event. 
So 1% of the time, they could owe us how much or more. So it's essentially a value at risk type of analysis. When I did this at USAA, what I did is I, I looked at how much the floating rate could move relative to the longer term. And I looked back historically at how interest rates have moved historically. And I did a one in a hundred year event. I did, I think I did it over 14 days. I mean, they have to put the collateral in there every day. So I could have just done over one day, but I did over 14 days, I wanna be conservative. So I said over the next 14 days at a 1% probability, what's the most they would owe me if interest rates really, really moved? And that was my potential exposure. And so I went, when I went to the CEO and he asked me, what's your exposure to JP Morgan? I wouldn't tell him what JP Morgan owed me on the swap. What I would tell him is how much could they owe me in a, in a kind of an extreme scenario. And what they owe me in the swap doesn't really mean much because I've got collateral sitting there. So that's the other thing I got to do is if there's $100 million in collateral sitting there, that reduces my exposure. So I can count that against my potential exposure. So yeah, maybe they could owe me $200 million pretty quickly, but I got 100 sitting there now. So I've got some protection. And so that's, that's how I set up um, my exposure there. Unlike if I loan JP Morgan $100 million in debt, I don't have a potential exposure. I just have exposure. I, or, you know, they owe me $100 million. That number is easy. I just take it right off the bond covenant. I know exactly what they owe me. Maybe they owe me some interest too or accrued interest. But those are small. That's small. But y'all can see potential exposure. Um, I doubt your banks have the term potential exposure. They will most likely have counterparty risk in there or the word counterparty. I would search on the word counterparty for your, your company. It's likely to be under the credit risk section because that's really what it is. But you might search on potential exposure. It, it is a fairly common term. Um, all right, so, so balance sheet immunization for banks. Banks aren't the only ones that do this and we call it all different terms. Um, life insurance companies call it asset liability management. Property casualty companies call it DFA. Uh, pension plans call it balance sheet immunization. Um, you know, we have different terms. Um, there is a term out there. Let's see if I can figure this out. It's called LDI. Anybody want to guess? This is really what pension plans. It's the same for everybody, but pension plans started using LDI. Any guesses on LDI stands for? I don't think y'all will get it, but just curious. Any guesses on the L? We've been talking about L's already, so why do you want to guess on that one? If you put it in the chat, I may not see it, so you might just have to say it. Okay. Dimitri said liability. That is that is right. Liability. And then I'll just take another stab at uh the middle letter. Uh diversification. Question mark. No, not diversification. Good guess. Any other guesses? Liability. Any guesses on the I? It's not immunization. All right, so yeah, liability is good. All right, so I love this phrase, but it's only in, used with, but it's used with pension plans, but it's called liability driven investing. What does that mean? That means your investment decisions are driven by what liabilities you have, which is exactly what everybody should be doing. So liability driven investing. I, I have a, uh, a magazine, I think I still have it. I'll have, to, I'll have to pull it out and bring it to class if I can find it. The front cover, it said, is LDI dead? So they're asking, is anyone, USA was doing LDI, so it wasn't dead where I was, but is LDI dead? And we'll talk about that when we talk about pension plans. So, you know, we have these different terms. Balancing immunization, I think banks use that, but it may not be that common of a term. I guess if you type that in your banks, um, 
annual report, that probably will not come up. I'm pretty sure liability driven investing will not come up. Um, DFA for PNC insurance. DFA is dynamic financial analysis. It includes more than just interest rate risk. It includes catastrophes and everything else, but it's essentially asking the same thing. If we model our assets and our liabilities, is there something we can do with our assets in order to reduce the volatility of our net worth? So you see what we're trying to do here? We're trying to find ways to better match our assets and liabilities so we protect our net worth. That's the real key to all of these. We don't want a volatile net worth because that makes us a volatile company. So we wanna somehow bring everything as close together as possible. All right, so here's what I'm gonna do on this next, next Tuesday. We'll come back to this and work last year's exam problem. So you can get some practice. If you want more than just one, let me know. We can work two. I think after you do this two or three times, it gets it gets pretty redundant because you're just doing the exact same steps over and over again. But just to let you let it sink in a little bit. Um, I will put I will put the problem out there on blackboards. So if you want to work it in advance, and I encourage you to do that, you can do that over the weekend. So you let it sink in, get some practice. Maybe I'll put a couple of problems out there. Get some practice. And then after you do that, then you're probably you're probably set, except for the exams a few weeks away. So you're going to forget it all before you do the exam. So you don't want to forget this. This is really powerful stuff. And probably the most important is you understand what you're doing. If you can understand here, we're, we're trying to manage the balance sheet by looking at what we do with assets and liabilities because we want to protect that net worth. We don't want that net worth flying up and down. Remember, especially banks and life insurance companies and pension plans, there's not much net worth there. A bank is like 10 to one, right? $10 of assets, $1. Life insurance companies are 10 to one. Pension plans are 10 to, 10 to zero. They don't have a lot, a lot of them have deficits. Property casualty is a little bit different. They may be 10 to four because they have catastrophe risk. They have to hold more net worth. They're, they're just volatile by, by definition. But that's the key is, can we do something intelligently that we don't radically change our expected returns, but we can radically reduce risk? And that's always what you want to do in finance. If we can reduce risk without harming our expected returns much, we've done something great for our company. We've made it a much more valuable company. All right, so again, we ask questions on this. You've gone through the entire problem. Do y'all feel more comfortable or is it like still feels like you've never seen this before in your life? I can get y'all talking better in live than I can on swap. I'm not a good, I mean, on uh, Zoom. I'm not a good Zoom interactor. Plus all of y'all are on, uh, your videos are off, so I can't even see y'all. So, um, all right, well, let it sink in. Try the practice problem. You'll have the YouTube to help practice, help help you with that, um, get comfortable with it. But while you're doing it, think about what you are doing. Don't just plug in numbers and go. It's, that doesn't help you at all. You've got to know what are we trying to accomplish. So if you go work for a bank, let's say you interview with the bank. What I just said about protecting net worth, by looking at the assets and liabilities and finding investment strategies to help reduce that, that's such an incredibly important concept for banks and even more so for insurance companies. Life insurance companies are probably the best in the business at this, better than anybody else. Um, I think they're better than banks, mainly because a life insurance business, we'll talk about it some, it's much more complicated than the bank on the interest rate risk. The credit risk is, is more complicated at the bank, but the interest rate risk is much more complicated at the life insurance side. And because of that, they're just far more adept at managing these risks, they're, they're far more, more intelligent, far more complex in what they have to do, which it can get pretty tough. They don't just do swaps, they also do collar, they also do caps and floors and all other kinds of things because the life insurance business is pretty complex. Now, when you look at your bank, 
remember when a bank manages interest rate risk, they're using interest rate futures, interest rates forwards, and interest rate swaps. And if so, if your bank is doing futures and forwards and swaps on the interest rate side, this is what they're doing. It's balance sheet immunization. There's really no other reason for them to do this. So look up terms like futures and swaps and see where that is and, and try to understand what they're doing. I don't know if any of y'all have gotten far enough into the market risk on your bank to see that they're doing this. You're gonna, you, you'll probably have to read a little bit between the lines because they won't use the exact jargon I'm using. But I think if you're really paying attention, you're going you're gonna to get, oh, wow, Claudia, I just saw that you got the driven investments. Wow, very good. Um, so, um, so think about what you're doing and realize this, this, we can go, we could, we could spend semesters on this and not even scratch the surface. This is a pretty complex part of finance. I love it because you can actually do something here. So where are we going to go from here? So here, I want to introduce pension plans and then I want to introduce the big essay question for exam one, which is one of my favorite questions. So let's first understand, you might say this is not that, that important because no one does pension plans anymore, but it's still such an incredibly important concept and pension plans is the best way to show it. If I could show it to you with a life insurance company, I would, but we don't want to go that advanced. That's just too, we'd be jumping off the edge to do that. So pension plans is that good in between banks and life insurance companies to really get into the meat of this issue. So what is a pension plan? So a pension plan is when a company provides a retirement benefit to their employees where they say, when you retire, we will pay you a monthly income of some amount and we'll pay it until you die. And we might even increase it with inflation. Social Security does exactly that. Social Security is essentially a pension plan. Social Security pays you a monthly income, increases it with inflation every year, and pays you until you die. It's a really nice, nice benefit. Um, so that's a pension plan. So what is that liability? The liability is those cash flows you've promised to your employees until they die, which could be 40, 50, 60 years from now. You may have some employees that are still working. And there are many pension plans still out there because state governments, teachers, firemen, policemen, um, cities, a lot of government-related entities still use pension plans. USA set that, set, uh, shut their pension plan down, um, something I fought hard against. I wanted the USA to keep their pension plan, but they shut theirs down. A lot of Private firms have shut their pension plans down and moved to 401k plans, but I still think it's a really good concept. So I want to move to this. I'm hoping you've all read this blog, but it asks a really important question. Maybe one of my favorite questions to ask. This is a question I would love to ask in an interview, but... Let me put it out there and let's get your initial reaction. If you read, you'll have some idea. So if a firm can borrow at 4% and invest in stocks, making an expected return, not a given return, expected return of 8% would borrowing to invest, increase the value of the firm. All right, so you should, you should have, there's one, one reason I, well, maybe the main reason I love this question is it draws on almost every single finance class you've taken. Everything's in there. Miller Medigliani, capital asset pricing model, uh, cost benefit analysis, MPV, it's, it's just, it's just got it all in there, balance sheet immunization, everything's in there. So let's say uh, I'll use AT&T because I had a big debate with a guy from AT&T. Uh, I, I gave up on the debate, but only because he was much taller than I was. And I didn't want to get in fist fights with him, but it was a pretty intense debate. Uh, he essentially called me an idiot. So I'm going to debate with him with my class because I, I didn't want to take him on. But he believes that if AT&T borrows at 4% and puts all that money in the stock market to make 8%, that AT&T's value goes up. 
I argue that AT&T's value would actually fall in that scenario. So why do I say one and he says the other? Now he's got the advantage of industry. A lot of people do what, what he says to do. I got the advantage of financial theory. So I've got textbooks, academia on my side. He's got practice on his side. For me to be right, I've got to argue why I think this industry is doing something that is wrong. Why so many people in this industry are doing something I think is actually destroying value. Because that doesn't make sense. Why You wouldn't expect a large part of a, um, a free economy to be doing something that's destroying value. That doesn't make sense. On his side, he's got to explain why what he's doing how it can so contradict what academia teaches. So he, he ought to explain where is academia wrong. It can't just say, we just do this, we know it's right, but with no theoretical basis for it, all right? Um, I'm, I'm essentially gonna force you to take my side of the argument because you're taking my class, but you're more than welcome in the exam to give my side of the argument. And then if you want to debate against it, I'll give you, and Oxy will give you some of the debates on the other side, but y'all see what the question is. Now, some of you are probably thinking, but I thought you were talking about pension plans. All right, well, you have to tie this back to a pension plan. So what does this mean? So a pension plan, you think about it, what the firm is doing, instead of paying their employees today, they instead set aside earnings, employee earnings today to fund a future payout to the employees. Now, if you think about it, this is really debt. This is really borrowed money. I don't know if y'all see that. But if you tell your employees, hey, instead of paying you uh, $500 a month, you know, we'll pay you $5,000 a month, but we're not going to pay $5,500 a month. We're going to take $500 that we would have given you, and we're instead going to set it aside. We're going to keep your money, and then we'll pay it back to you when you retire. That's borrowed money. It's not their money. They're taking somebody else's money and promising them they'll, they'll pay them back in the future. So a pension plan is essentially borrowing money at some interest rate. And most pension plans are taking that money and sticking it into the stock market. And I'm arguing that that destroys value. All right. Now, how many of y'all read the, the blog? So there's two pieces to this. You've got the blog itself. But you also have a very famous article, Randy Arnott. It's out there on Blackboard. There's two versions of it. There's Randy Arnott's actual article. And then you have my, my rewritten part of his article. A lot of this article is in my blog. So if you, if you skip this, you'll still have it. But I encourage you to read Rand, Randy Arn, or I'm sorry, Robert Arnott's I'm sorry, there's a guy named Randy Arnott at USA. So this is Robert Arnott's article. Robert Arnott is one of my favorite people in finance. He's an award-winning writer. You should go on YouTube and watch his YouTubes. You should search for his articles. Brilliant, brilliant man. He does some really, really interesting analyses. He's really in the smart beta right now um, and fundamental weighting indexes. He's kind of the champion of those. So. Great, great, very, very smart man. When I first met him, I, I thought he was maybe a little on the arrogant side because he just seemed like a little office. And then I discovered he's not arrogant. He's just real humble, real quiet. He's not real pompous at all. He's actually the exact opposite. I just couldn't get him to talk to me and he's just kind of quiet. But he's actually a, a very down to earth, very friendly guy. I saw him speak at several conferences and oh, just an incredibly good speaker. Everybody just, a lot of times you have a speaker come in and half, half the room is on their phones. But when he was speaking, everybody just glued to everything he's saying. And afterwards, everybody's talking about it. Just, just incredible speakers. So, I, you know, there's a few people in finance, Robert Arnott, Cliff Asnes. There's a few others. That I just think 
watch their YouTubes, read their blogs, go to their companies that they, they work for and see what, what they're writing because these are the people that are really changing our industry and you want to read what they're writing when they write it so that you're ahead of everybody else. So really, really important people. He's he's probably about my age, so he may be getting close to retirement. I don't know, but brilliant, brilliant man. What's interesting, he wrote this not as an article. Robert Arnott used to be the editor of the Financial Analyst Journal. So this is just an editorial piece he threw together for that just you know real short article at the at the beginning. And I loved it. I use it all the time. Um, I saw him at USA when he was the editor, and I was I was so glad I could because I had a chance to tell him because that was the best the financial analyst journal ever was when he was editor. The articles he published or put into there were just the best articles they ever had. Very interesting conversations. So just I'm a big fan of Robert Arnott. Highly encourage you to seek him out. Um, and so he wrote this and boy, it just really changed my whole thinking about pension plans. So why did I get into this? Why was this so such a big idea? So let me give you a little introduction. I think it's in the blog. But life insurance companies have annuities. And so the reason this whole thing came up to me is I, I'm, I'm running USA's pension plan. It's a kind of a mid-sized $3 billion pension plan. Not, not massive, not like the state of Illinois or California or something, but a decent size. It's one of the top 1,000 pension plans in the country. So a $3 billion pension plan. And when I inherited, it was 70% stocks and 30% intermediate corporate bonds. That's why I inherited. Oh, sorry, sorry. I put that in wrong. Don't, don't write that down. That's what I got on the pension plan. But I'd worked with our life insurance annuities, actuaries, and they're 100% corporate bonds. So I went to my buddy, John, my actuary friend who ran, did that, the asset liability management for the annuities. I go, okay, John, I just, I got this pension plan and I'm responsible for it. And its liabilities look a lot like your liabilities. Very similar, man. Annuities is promising someone a monthly income until they die. So, okay, John, man, we have we have very similar products. You don't, the biggest difference is inflation. You don't pay inflation. I ain't pay inflation. And that could be material, what we're going to discuss here. I go, John, you're 100% bonds. You don't buy any stocks at all. I'm 70% stocks and 30% bonds. Why do you think that is? And his answer is, because you guys are idiots. And he was pretty outspoken. Always tell me, I mean, that's, that was a direct quote from him. You guys are idiots. Um, so Jonah's asking where this paper is. Everything's on Blackboard under miscellaneous. So you'll see it under miscellaneous. There's two of the Arnott articles. One's his original and the one's my rewritten one. And they're, they're, if you can't find it, Jonah, let me know, but it should be pretty easy to find on Blackboard. So, um, when John said that, I started doing more research. And why do pension plans put so much money in the stocks, whereas a new life insurance companies that have a very similar liability don't buy any stocks at all? It's extremely rare for a life insurance company to have an allocation to stocks, unless they have variable products, which is a very different different thing. And those aren't on their books; they're on separate accounts. They're separate books. All right. So this is what got me started, and then I read. Robert Arnott's article. And then I start debating and discussing, and I was working with our actuaries at USA. We had a pension actuary um, and we had, we actually had two pension actuaries. One was for executives and the other one was for the general population. Very smart people again. So I had all these actuaries to talk to, which was very, very helpful. And they understood this question as well, but they had never had any say on the investment side. They essentially were overdoing their job on the liability side and the investment people, they just left us alone. And I said, no, we, we need to work together. We're, we're all in this together. We've got a job to do. We need to pay our employees uh, the future incomes and we got to make sure we're investing in a way that we can do exactly what we promised them. All right. So this is the question. So what are you going to draw in on? So whack. 
And cap M is extremely important. So on the exam, you're gonna have to do all of these. Some students say, wow, Professor Sweet, you're so picky on this essay. I don't think I'm picky, picky at all. What students say I'm picky about, I actually think is absolutely fundamental to understanding finance and understanding these questions. So I'm, I don't think I'm picky at all. I think I'm actually picky where it's where it, the most important stuff you need to know in finance. So if you're, if you're uncertain how to answer this question, I'm telling you now, you've already learned everything you need the question is to put it together. The other thing is net present value, DCF, and discount rates. Active management is in here. And there's several things in this equation that are ex extremely, extremely important. So when you go to the blog, I've got the blog as a PowerPoint. So we'll actually next class walk through the PowerPoint. But one thing I wanna do is talk about the pension plan liabilities. Just, I wanna do that real quick. We'll come back to this, but I want, I want you to understand if we're gonna invest in a way that we best match the liability, what does that liability have? And these are the four risks of a pension plan liability. Number one is longevity risk. You're promising to pay people money until they die. You have risk that they live a very, very long time. I was talking about it in my life insurance class. There were people out there trying to discover how to stop people from aging. Uh, and they think they can do it. There's really no reason for the human body to age. It's just in our DNA, we just age. Um, so, why is that? Someone discovers that, boy, this, these pension plans, Social Security is going to be bankrupt, or you just will never retire. You know, if you can live to be 200 years old, you're going to retire at 160. I mean, that's that may seem depressing, so you better really like your career, but that's longevity risk. The second one is anti-selection risk. I, I saw this at USA. Most pension plans say when you hit retirement, you have a choice. You can take a lump sum of your pension plan, or you can go into the annuity and we'll pay you till you die. Well, healthy people are likely to take the annuity because they know they're going to live a long time. Unhealthy people will always take the lump sum. If they've got some family history or some major disease, they'll take the lump sum because they, the pension's based on the average person. They don't tell you your lump sum based on your health. It's based on the average. So if you're less healthy than average, you'll get a lot more money taking the lump sum. If you're a lot healthier than average, you might be better off taking the uh, pension payments until you die. So that's anti-selection. So you have that risk, which can be a huge risk. The next one's inflation risk, which obviously this last year has been huge. Pension plans have had increased their, you know, we saw, I saw it with my mom's social security. I run her financial plan. She got a huge raise this year from social security because inflation was so high. So you get what's called a COLA, cost of living adjustment. At USAA, that was capped at 10%, but that's still a high percent. So I think it was 80% of the, of the consumer price index up to 10%. So if inflation was 7%, you would get 80% of 7% as a raise. If inflation was 20%, you, the most you get was a 10% raise. But still, you had inflation, so inflation risk was important. And then the last risk, which is the one we're really going to focus in on, is interest rate risk. Because that liability that you put on your balance sheet is nothing more than the present value of all those expected future payments. And that present value uses a current interest rate. So when interest rates fall, that liability is going to shoot up dramatically. And I'll show you all that uh, with numbers next class. Uh, you'll see in my rewritten article, I have this table. And I believe everyone in our class should be able to build this table from scratch in Excel. You should be able to do this easily. If you read P uh, Robert Arnott's article, he does it very differently. I think the way he does it to me is a little confusing because he just has way too much in there. He does, he does 70 cash flows. I just do two cash flows. So I simplify it. And his is a little hard to read because his graphs, his graphs are a little bit complex. So I'm trying to simplify it for you. So next class, we'll try to understand this table, make sure we really understand what this risk is all about. 
But this is what Robert Arnott is saying. So just in a nutshell, what he's saying is very, very critical. When you're discounting a cash flow, the cash flows that are way out into the future, in present value terms, they're very, very small because of the discounting process. So those long, long, long-term liabilities, they're, they're a small fraction of your liability. However, those long, long-term liabilities have the most duration. So while they're the smallest part of your liability, they're also super sensitive to interest rates. So they're the smallest part of your liability, but they're the biggest part of the volatility of your liability. So what Robert Arnott is saying is, you have this part of your liability that's only 10, 15% of your liability, but it's 70% of the volatility of your liability. Why don't we just hedge that piece? Why don't we use swaps, interest rate swaps, and let's just hedge off that risk? Because if interest rates change, that 15% of your liability is gonna have a huge impact if interest rates fall because it's so sensitive to interest rates. So why don't we just hedge that one piece, which makes perfect sense. Now I went overboard, now I, I hedged the entire thing, but that was what he was recommending. Now I'm gonna talk about a little bit why Robert Arnott didn't go as far as I went on this for me hedging the entire thing. We're gonna have that discussion, it's in my blog. I don't think that he's wrong and I'm right because I would never say that with Robert Arnott. I think actually Robert Arnott, Arnott would probably agree with me but he also understands the politics of this. And we'll talk about that. The four other risks he talks about. I mean, he talks about four. Well, he talks about three. I expanded to four. This, this list I just gave you is, is the subcomponents of one of the risks he's talking about. He talks about two others and I add another one. What he's saying, the reason he doesn't hedge the entire risk, he only hedges a small piece, is because of the politics of pension plans and the inertia. We're going to get into that. So there's so much here. If you can understand this, I think it's going to really jumpstart you into a whole different level in finance. This is where you get from the textbook to reality. And I, I just think it's incredibly powerful. So read the blog. If you want to read the blog in the Arnott article, the Arnott article is not that long. If I were you, I'd read the blog first and then read the Arnott article, the rewritten one that I wrote, his, his has a, is a little too jargon heavy. I got rid of the jargon and replaced it. He, he tended to switch terms. And I, I try to be consistent with terms all the way throughout. I'm really excited about this. I love this question because it really, really makes you come face to face with the theory of finance. You got to decide if you agree with what the textbooks are telling you, or if you're going to throw all that out and just do what industry is doing. And this is probably the best example of that. All right. So next class, pretty exciting. Hopefully we'll face to face because I want to see you guys passing out at your desk, which is how exciting this stuff is. This is it. This is the most exciting stuff. Um, yeah, well, I'll um, usually extra problems like that. I usually put them under the exam review under Blackboard. They're just extra exam problems. So I'll just look under there and then I'll put it in my uh, weekly email that they're there. I put several balance sheet immunization problems out there under the exam review. Some of them have answers. You have to be a little careful when the answer is in Excel because sometimes I have typos in Excel. So, you know, it, it's possible there's there's a math error or something just because I didn't, I gave the right answer, but I didn't change the numbers in the description because it's hard to type in Excel. Well, pick one of those and work it next Tuesday. Just give you a little more practice on it. It's a really, really practical problem. So tonight, what I want to do is address one of my favorite problems in finance because it covers so much stuff. I'm not going to go on a screen show because then I had to hit escape and then Zoom comes back and it's all kinds of hassle. So, uh, but you have my 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 uh, blog that discusses it. So again, this is a question I asked the actuary. Why are pension plans so different than life insurance? Life insurance companies do not buy stocks. Just doesn't make sense for them to buy stocks. Something run by actuaries. And then on the, on the pension side, almost all pension plans buy heavy amounts of stocks, 60, 70% in stocks, pretty common to do. So what is the, what is the reason for that? And what does theory say? 
And so I, this is the thing, I, I get into some baits on this, but um, I, some students confused, why are you talking about pension plans and the title says borrowing to invest. So I talked about that on Tuesday. A pension plan is essentially borrowing money from your employees. It's borrowed money and there's an interest rate because there's a discount rate for that. So you're borrowing $100 and you're going to have to pay back 120 or 150 or 200 20, 30 years from now. Um, it looks a lot like borrowed money and doesn't make sense to borrow money. Just invest in the stock market if you're, if you're a company like this. Um, we, we had some practical questions like this. I remember at USA, they allowed employees to borrow from their 401k plan and they had to pay it back when they paid it back with interest what they pay back plus the interest went into their accounts and people are like wow this is free money i can borrow fifty thousand dollars of my money invest it in the stock market and then i pay it back with interest and i got this extra money it's the exact same error in that logic as here because they have to come up with the money and pay themselves back and they have to pay themselves back. Obviously the stock market falls 20%, they're gonna be out. Um, but they also, when they took the money out of 401k plan, they're no longer earning in the 401k plan. So, you know, it's it's really bad math, but I, I was absolutely shocked. The percentage of USA employee, employees that borrowed from their 401k plans, which is directly related to this because this is the alternative to the 401k plan. So I'll, I'll talk about this friend of mine whose 401k plan should have been three, four hundred thousand dollars because she worked there for 30 years, but it was only like sixty thousand dollars because she kept taking money out of it to take care of her son and work on her house. Where's your money? You should have a bunch, but she had a pension plan that was worth several hundred thousand dollars. Good thing. <laughs> she didn't have that pension plan, she would have been, she would have been unable to retire. Um so let's look at it. I mean, let's look at the question. Well, the value of a firm, I love to ask this question in interviews. I get a lot of blank stares. Will the value of a firm increase if the firm borrows at 3% and invests in a well-diversified stock portfolio with an expected return of 8%? Sounds, sounds too good to be true. What's, what's the key word in this whole thing? Expected. What if you were guaranteed an 8% return from the US government? Would you borrow 3% invest at eight? Yeah, that, that'd be pretty easy to do. I would do that all day long. Assuming the US government doesn't default. How does it apply to the pension plan? Well, a pension plan is a way of borrowing money from your employees. A 401k plan is not that. A 401k plan is not anywhere on the balance sheet of a company. It's a completely separate account. It's the employee's money. The company doesn't touch it. It's a completely separate entity. But the pension plan is on the company's balance sheet. It's part of their liabilities. So you can see why some firms want to get rid of pension plans. So what does finance say about this? Well, first of all, what does finance say borrowing does to your beta? So we'll, we'll look at that. What does financial labor do the risk? We talked last time about the pension liability risk. That's pretty important. And then tying that back to what we just done, balance sheet immunization, making sure Whatever we do with the assets is related to what the liabilities are doing, that, that liability-driven investing. What does all this mean for the, the value of the firm? Why do pension plans, that was the question Jonah asked me, why do pension plans invest the way they do? They've been doing it for years. Why did they do that? It sounded, it sounded really great because the stock market was up a bunch in the 80s and 90s. I was like, see, we're right. We should have invested in stocks. The last 20 years, it's been an absolute disaster, partly because interest rates have fallen so much, which caused those pension liabilities to soar. And then the stock market has been you know, up and down, up and down, up and down. I know we're hitting records, but um, most pension plans are, in, especially state pension plans are in serious trouble. The entire state of Illinois is a disaster because of its pension plan. The state of California has pension plans they may never be able to pay off. Um, and there's countries, Japan has pension plans. They're not sure how they're going to pay them. You know, it's just all, all over the place. In the U.S., Social Security, Social Security is not as probably as bad off as Medicare, but it's still a concern. I don't know how many of you are putting Social Security into your retirement plan. Are you all assuming there's going to be anything there for you? You're just going to say, hey, if I get anything, it's gravy. That's great. But otherwise, I'm just assuming it's not going to be there. Um, I'm glad it's there because it's, 
it's 100% of my mom's income other than her portfolio. Um, gives her about 2000 a month and her assisted living is $6,000 a month. So it covers a portion of her costs. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll talk about this. This is a serious issue in the US. This is mainly an issue for states, cities, because most uh, private firms have eliminated their pension plan, which I think is a mistake. So this is part of my point is when finance doesn't follow good theory, we end up with disaster. Why do we do we end up harming our employees? Something that really was, I think, quite valuable. I fought really hard at USA to keep the pension plan. I lost that argument, but I could see that one person, boy, is so, she was so lucky she had a pension plan because it was the only thing that saved her. And then how do you apply this to you as an individual? Because you essentially have a pension plan. You have to fund your own retirement. So how does that affect you? All right. So that's where we're going to go. The, the best part of this question is it draws on a lot of finance you've already learned. So let's let's talk about stuff you've already learned. So first of all, what does borrowing do to your risk? And the second question is, what do you invest in with that borrowed money? All right. So if you're going to borrow a billion dollars, that's debt. So finance has something to say about that and risk. But then if you invest it in something that's high risk or low risk, that also affects your risk. So what do you do with the funds? Oh. So, uh, wow, someone liked that point. Make sure y'all are on mute out there, wherever you are. This is the big downside of a Zoom. Y'all see who it is? All right. Someone was playing like a TV game show or something with one class. All right. So Cap Cap M, you know Cap M backwards and forwards. This was this was my favorite question in in interviews. Talk about Cap M. What does it say? Blank stare, blank stare, blank stare. It's like you cover Cap M in what every single finance class you've ever taken over and over again, and then it comes an interview. Undergraduate finance students can't talk about it. It's kind of depressing to me. I had students from my class I was interviewing. I'm like, we talked about this. I didn't say anything. I'm thinking, how could you not give me an answer? But for some reason, we we were teaching in a way that it's not not retaining. So let's apply it. Let's apply CAPM. So what is CAPM? It gives you a discount rate for the firm, really for the equity of the firm, right? CAPM only gives you the cost of equity capital, not the weighted average cost of capital. It says the relevant risk is systematic risk. That's really, really key to this question, systematic risk. All right. I've measured by the firm's beta, which is tied to the overall stock market or the economy. Y'all remember that? A defensive stock has what kind of beta? 0. 0.6 or 1.6? 0.6, a cyclical company? Four. So Ford might have a 2, 2.2, Kroger's, they didn't have all that debt, be like a 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5. That's a systematic risk. We're not looking at the risk of Ford or the risk of Kroger's. We're looking at the systematic risk. Kroger's could be a really, really risky company, but a lot of that risk disappears because of diversification. It just kind of gets wiped out because it's not related to anything else. So when you put it in your portfolio, a lot of that risk, and some of y'all seen the math, probably 80, 70 to 85%, and we'll talk about this later when we talk about diversification, 70 to 85% of a risk of a company is that unsystematic risk that disappears. So we're really focused on systematic risk, which is really, really critical to this, this discussion. The way the average cost of capital does what when you use more debt? Ignoring taxes? The cost of debt is lower than the cost of equity. But as you increase the weight of debt, the cost of equity goes up. And if you ignore taxes, increasing debt has no impact on your cost of capital. It stays the same. Why? Because the higher risk of the debt increases the beta, offsets the lower cost of the cost of debt. All of a sudden, y'all have seen that. Miller Medigliani, seen that over and over again. When you in incorporate taxes, which I'm somewhat ignoring here, but I'm I've thought through the tax piece. I think it actually even strengthens my argument because of the way pension plans are taxed. I think it actually even makes it stronger. Um, but before tax, adding more debt makes the firm more risky. And so shifting from high cost equity to lower cost 
debt doesn't reduce your cost of capital because your beta is going up. So, so investing borrow funds. So what are we? So there's borrowing money just makes the firm risky. Doesn't change the value of the firm according to Miller DiGliani if you ignore taxes because you have you're just making more risky. Trying to use cheaper debt doesn't help you at all. But what about what do you use those funds for? If you borrow a billion dollars and stick it into the stock market, what's the beta of the stock market? It's one. And how much of that risk is systematic risk? It's all systematic risk. It's a pure beta play. So you're you're doing something your stockholders are already doing, don't they? Aren't they? Aren't you just giving them more of what they already have? So think about this from a net present value product, and we're going to talk about that. Usually a firm will borrow a billion dollars and invest it into the firm. And it's kind of a net present value based on what project they're investing in, what its risk is, what its, what's its betas is. But here they're not reinvesting in the firm, they're reinvesting in the market. Essentially, what are they doing? They're borrowing money to put their stockholders more in the stocks. They're essentially increasing the stock allocation of their stockholders because they're borrowing money to invest in the stock market. Mm -hmm. So in that case, the impact of borrowing money on a pension plan actually increases the beta of the firm more than what Miller DiMignani says. Why is that? Well, there's a couple of things going on with the pension plan. First of all, a pension plan is extremely long liability, which means when interest rates fall, this liability is mushrooms. When do interest rates fall in a strong economy or a weak economy? Weak economy. When does the pension plan really kill a company? When their stock is falling for other reasons. It's like the worst kind of beta place. So they're borrowing, the kind of borrowing they're doing is very high beta type of borrowing, right? This isn't their normal borrowing. This is an extremely, it's like, they normally borrow five-year debt and they just decided to borrow 50-year debt. That's what the pension plan is. It's very, very high beta. And the other thing is pension plans have COLAs, which is also a systematic risk. So when rates fall, they're killed because the liability goes up. When the economy is strong, inflation rises, they're, they're killed on the other side. So it's it's the pension plan itself is a very high beta a way to borrow money. And then you're gonna take that money and just stick it in the stock market there's, you know, think about the question, are you adding value for the stockholder? Is anything management doing here helping the stockholder? So the very ex existence of a pension plan increases the beta of a firm. <laughs> the liability, liability rises dramatically when rates fall during a recession. And again, taxes, I'm gonna ignore it, but I think it strengthens my argument. Pension plans are very, very bizarrely taxed. Um, I'm trying to even remember the rules and that they may have changed since since I retired. Um, very bizarre. Uh, and a lot of it's based not on the pension plan itself, but on the timing of the funding. When you fund, the tax comes into the funding and the IRS is real restrictive on when you can fund. Um, so we're gonna ignore taxes. So, all right, so up to there, if I understand borrowing money through a pension plan is just by its nature a very high beta transaction. You can see why firms don't want to have pension plans. It's just something that, and you think about 2008 is a good example. I'm going to talk about 2008, but um, in 2008, pension liability, pension plans, There, I have an article that showed, I should have kept the magazine, I wish I had, but it had the 1,000 largest pension plans in the United States, and 999 of them saw went from a surplus to a large deficit in 2008. What else was happening in 2008? Financial crisis, stock market crashing. So these firms seeing their stocks crash and their pension plan is losing hundreds of millions of dollars. Disaster. You're leveraging up. So any, any questions up to that point? I think the real key, and we'll talk about it later, there are a lot of firms who want to do what I'm suggesting, which is to immunize this risk. But their, their excuse for not doing it wasn't because of recession or stock market. It was really because interest rates were too low. Uh, 
the plan I immunized, we immunized it when interest rates were high. So we had a huge advantage. It didn't cost us that much to do it. But most firms, after they had a huge loss in 2008, they're thinking, well, you know, if interest rates ever get high again, we're going to immunize. And then they didn't get high again forever. Now, firms are thinking, wow, I can get five, six percent on a bond. And the stock market's not priced to give me much more than seven or eight. Yeah, this wouldn't be a bad time to immunize. So more people are thinking about it now. In the UK, many more funds have immunized in the UK versus the US. I'm not sure exactly. It might be the government and the way it, it regulates them. So thinking that a recession is coming, I've never heard of pension plans say, oh, wow, well, we, we, should, we should change our risk for that. And then two, 2021 was somewhat of a disaster um, because inflation was rising while the stock market was falling. So you think interest rates rising, that'll bring the liability down, but then they haven't used a high, higher COLA. So they're, the, the cash flows that they're discounting are higher cash flows, but using a higher discount rate, they probably didn't get much benefit out of the higher interest rates. So yeah, it's it's a complex entity. Are y'all getting a little bit of sense of this? We'll go through the entire argument and then we can kind of go back and we can go back and summarize. Now let's think about another thing you did in one of your finance classes, which was net present value. So cost benefit analysis, you're assessing whether a project adds value by discounting all those future cash flows and comparing it to the cost of the project. Y'all remember that. Y'all can do that in your sleep. Probably better than accountants can. Um, in fact, I remember when I started my career, uh, 20 years before y'all were born, um, I mean, to me, discounting cash flows, that's what we I was an accounting major. Everybody does that. And they gave me a project to do some net present value. Thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And I was surrounded by all these accountants. And they're like, oh, how do you do that? I don't remember. How, how do you know like, this kind of cash flow? And they completely have forgotten. And that's because I hadn't done it in several years. So try not to become a this dinosaur. I'm worried I've become a dinosaur since I retired. But don't learn something and forget it. Find some way to apply it because they had forgotten, completely forgotten all that. So um, <laughs> cost benefit analysis, discounting the cash flow. So if the discounted benefits exceed the cost, then the project adds value to the firm. Otherwise, it reduces value to the firm. All right, so here's, here's a question that's extremely important to this entire discussion. You invest $100,000 in the stock market. What is the net present value of that investment? So you take $100,000, so that's your cash outflow, and you're going to have some cash inflows from the stock market. You sit down, do your analysis, your net present value. Anybody know what's your net present value? Zero, right. It's going to be zero. Why is it zero? Because your discount rate reflects the risk of the stock market. I mean, it's going to be zero. Unless you know for a fact the stock market is undervalued or overvalued, which nobody does, yeah, it's zero. What's the net present value? You put $100,000 into a well-diversified bond portfolio. It's zero. The net present value of an investment is zero. Why? Because it's paying you exactly the risk unless you're absolutely sure that market's mispriced. And again, none of us, none of us know that. All right. So what does that mean here? When firms invest their pension investment portfolios in stocks, the net present value is zero. The price of stocks fully reflect your risks. So the return you're getting exactly compensates you for your risks. The net present value is zero. The, net, the discount rate is not the firm's cost of capital. The discount rate is a beta of one. You remember that when you did net present value, you didn't always use the firm's cost of capital. You use the cost of capital related to that particular project. So here, what project are you doing? You're investing in a one beta project. So your discount rate is going to be exactly the discount rate for the stock market. So you don't use the WAC. Now, if you use the WAC, then yeah, it looks wonderful. You think the stock market is going to make 8%, your cost of capital is 3%. Yeah, you get a positive net present value, but you've completely messed up the measurement of risk by, by doing that. That's pretty, pretty critical, but it gets worse. Most pension plans are actively invested, which means they're trying to beat the market. How often is, do they beat the market? <laughs> now, I, I read an economist article. They said 2021 was a rare time, or 2022 was a rare year when over 50% of active managers beat the market. But historically, it's been 10 to 15% beat the market. 
the overwhelming majority underperform the market, which means 90, 85, 90% 90 of the time, you're much better off just buying an index fund and just matching the market because you're usually going to lose out. But even, I just want to make this clear because this is going to be really important when we talk about asset allocation later. I'm going to question that economist article. I think they said 60% of managers beat their indices in 2022. Is that true? And what uh, the studies have found, well, first of all, uh, William Sharp wrote a really famous article saying this is mathematically impossible. All right, so let's start with Sharp's article. You have active managers and you have passive managers. You know what an active manager is? They're going to over allocate, meta, under allocate, um, Ford or whoever. Hopefully they did today. Um, they're going to try to make best to try to beat the market. Passive managers just buy the market. All right. Combined, they equal. The market return. Would you agree with that? Before expenses, it took all active managers, all passive managers, before fees, their returns should equal the market because they are the market. I'm not leaving anybody out. You have to be one or the other. You have to either be active or passive. All right. Everybody agree with that? Passive managers, by definition, get the market return four fees. I'll agree with that. That's what they're trying to do. So what does that tell you about active managers? By math, must get market return for fees. You agree with that? If everybody's getting the market, all the combined is the market, all the passive getting market because that's what they're doing, then the active must be getting the market too. All right. Before fees, whose fees are higher? Active, much higher, 40, 50, 60, 70 basis points higher, which means but after fees must be below market. So that's what William Sharp was arguing. He was arguing it is impossible for active managers as a group to beat the market. So he's saying this is impossible. So was he wrong? So let's talk about this one. But y'all see his argument. You can read his. You can read his paper. Really, really well written paper. If you're working for an active management firm, I wouldn't leave that, that article on your desk. But it's a very famous article where he makes the mathematics of active management. Uh, he makes that argument. So is this true? Well, there was a study done, and they may have updated it. What they showed is almost all out reported out performance was risk cheating. So how do you cheat as an active manager with risk? A large cap manager would do what? Buy small cap stocks. And what's the problem with that? You get a higher return, but they need to get a higher return because they took more risk. And there's been studies that shown most large cap managers that beat the market do so not by picking the right large cap stocks, but by allocating the small cap stocks. Essentially cheating. There's no small caps in their indices. So it's, are they violating Sharpe's argument? No. They didn't beat the market. They were in two markets and they're compared to one market. That's compared apples to oranges, it doesn't, it doesn't count. So that's part of the argument here. The exact same thing with developed market managers. How do they cheat? By, by emerging market. Now I didn't look at small cap last year. They probably outperformed large cap because it was the big tech companies that came under. I'd have to look at that, but that could be the indication in 2022 it wasn't that these managers did better, is that they were cheating. They had 20, 30% of their portfolio in another asset class 
that just happened to do well last year. And so it made it look like they're beating the market. What should you have done? You should have compared them like to a combined large cap small cap indice and then see how they had done. So one of the studies says you can explain almost all manager outperformance by them cheating like this. Now, I'm not talking about an individual manager. Certainly any individual manager can outperform. We're talking about as a group. When they say the entire group is doing really well, it's not that they're doing well. It's just they're cheating in an asset class that happened to do better than in indices. So um, that's what Sharp is arguing, which means when you do active management, you better be really good at picking managers because you're starting off at a pretty big disadvantage. If an active manager charges 70 basis points, they got to beat the market by 70 basis points just to tie, which is already pretty hard to do. And how do you beat the market? You beat the market by taking risk. So you're going to see that when you do the, the second project, you, you beat the market by taking risk. So it is it's tough to do. So what can you do? Well, you know what? I'm not good at picking active managers. I don't have time. So let's hire a consultant. That'll work, right? Well, hire someone who does nothing but hire active managers. That's their entire job. And there are several firms, Mercer, and several firms out there that do nothing but to go to pension plans and other places. And they say, here, we're going to help you find those active managers that are going to do well. And we did that at USA. You pay them, they're not that expensive, 300,000, 400,000 bucks. They come in find you some managers. And so we did this once and I said, I want to add a question to the request for proposal. I just want to ask when they recommend the manager from the day they recommend them, how does that manager do going forward? Does that seem fair question? The second you recommend them, do they are in the top 10%, top 25% and their track record, anyone want to guess? On average, when they recommend a manager, anyone want to guess how they do? Well, they all came in at 50%. Their managers were right in the middle. They didn't do better. They didn't do worse. So essentially, dartboard. And yet pension plans still pay a lot of money to do this. Why do pension plans do this? What does the board worry about? They're worried about getting sued. How do you not get sued? You pay a consultant 300,000 bucks. That's how you don't get sued. So there's a lot of, there's a lot going on. I, I, I really, I have a lot of trouble with how people behave when they're spending other people's money. I can give you many, many scenarios of that, but here's a case where they have a responsibility to be somebody else's money and their entire risk assessment is based on their own personal risk and not that of the client. And that's what they're doing. They're, they, they know they're doing something that has a very low probability of success, but they got to do it because they don't want to be sued. Now, what could they do instead? They could just go 100% passive, but then people are like, well, you're not doing your job. You got to at least try, you know, this is when passive management, it's pretty hilarious. When passive management came out with Vanguard in the late seventies, Fidelity came out and said, it's anti-American. Who wants to be, who wants to be mediocre? And then Fidelity is offering passive funds shortly thereafter because they were doing really, really well. Um, yeah, who wants to be mediocre? But passive is not mediocre. It's mediocre before fees, but after fees, it's really, really good. And that's what Jack Vogel says, the, you know, the founder of, of passive investing, essentially, is passive investing is, is essentially a, an inexpensive way to invest. You're saving money. It's a cost issue. The other thing I can tell you, uh, we went the passive, and I'm going to explain what we did at USA for our pension plan. We went the passive. We used to spend hours, hours, and hours trying to hire active managers. We hired 10 of them. Five would do great. Five would do horribly. We fired the five, we fired the five that did horribly, replaced them. The people they, that get replaced, they do horribly. The five that did well last year, they do horribly. The five we fired, guess how they do? They have their best, best year ever. It's like this Murphy's Law. We even tried to trick it once. We said, okay, we've got to fire this manager, but let's wait six months. We wait for six months. They have six horrible months, then they crash. Probably. Once we hired a manager, said, well, let's hire them, but let's don't give them money for six months. We gave them money and they did badly. You know, it's just, and I have cases where they've done really well, 
but it's it's 50 50 you know you're just you're just chasing your tail doing this it's so frustrating and if you go work for some of these funds that do this go work for hgb and their pension plan or usa if they still they probably switch back after i left yeah it's it's their headache uh, my staff went to a con con convention and they were sitting at a table with a bunch of pension plans that did active management and they're all sitting around talking about how much they hated their managers, how miserable their lives were. And my staff was just like, yeah, we don't have that problem. But we'll talk about why I switched to, to passive. Um, all right, so it's, I think it's worse than what the theory says because essentially a lot of these funds, it's not that the net present value is zero, the net present value is actually negative because they're throwing money away on management fees that don't give them any extra, extra added value. So what does that mean? When a firm offers a pension plan, they're increasing their financial leverage and their WAC in a very exaggerated way because of the nature of the pension plan. Very, very sensitive interest rates and to the economy. They invest in a stock market that has an expected less present value of zero or less. When you do all of that, I'm gonna argue that you're destroying the value of the firm. You're not doing anything to help the stockholders. The stockholders can do this themselves. If they want to borrow money to buy stocks, they can do that. They don't need AT&T to do that for them through their pension plan, right? AT&T, what should AT&T do? Have self, cell phone plans, Make they making movies now. I don't know what AT&T does anymore. That's what they should do. They shouldn't be betting on the stock market. Their stockholders can do that themselves. Uh -huh. like, um, I, uh, um, so this could be for like why would a uh, firm um, offer its um, employees a pension plan if they're not even just doing that? Well, it's it's an employment benefit. So why offer a pension plan? Why offer a 401k plan? It all comes down to the tax law. So the employer wants to provide the most compensation that they can through employee after tax. And the IRS says, hey, we got this 401k plan, you got pension plans, you can provide this. So you think about a pension plan, they're employed, and they're, instead of giving you a salary today that you have to pay tax on, they keep it and it gains tax-free. So you get, you, you have a whole lot money, more money when you retire. Now you have to pay tax when you retire. Same thing in your 401k plan. You get tax deferral and you have to pay. So it, the reason they offer these, I, I, most, most employers would rather just pay their employees a salary because these things are a hassle. But because of the tax code, they got to take advantage of that. And they'd be, they'd be harming their employees if they didn't. Wouldn't you agree? The tax code says your employees, you can increase their pay by just taking advantage of the tax code. The employer essentially has to do that or they're going to lose employees to other firms. Okay, so do, do they hire a uh, third party? Like, or like, like um, what you were saying before, the, um, like, like a consultant firm? They hire a, an army of people. Yeah, USA had their own pension actuary as an employee. We had a record keeper. We had an actuarial firm. We had a consultant. We had a custodial bank. Yeah, you got an army of people out there. All because the tax code says, we'll give your employees a tax break if you do this. You might argue we need to change the tax code and just tell people, hey, we'll pay you, you figure out how to invest and you're gonna pay tax, but we don't. The IRA, the uh, federal government says, you should be saving for your retirement, so we're gonna give you a tax advantage. Oh, you should be buying a house, we're gonna give you a tax advantage. Oh, you should be doing it, here's a tax advantage. Yeah, that's federal government. Employers say, okay, if that's the rules, we gotta maximize what we gotta pay your employees. So we're gonna do healthcare, y'all know that my class, right, Joshua, healthcare is the worst. Not only does an employer get a tax break, the employee never pays tax. It's the worst, worst there is. It's it's an incentive to buy a lot of health insurance, which does what? Greatly increase the cost of health care because the healthcare industry, man, they fill that gap in really fast. So yeah, it's you you can certainly complain. I'm not going to talk about um, you know take a economics fiscal policy class. So you can certainly debate if our tax laws should be encouraging these kind of things. But yeah, you're, and you want your employer to do that, don't you? You want your employer to give you the best after-tax compensation possible. And that's what they're going to do here. Now, Diego, you may be asking, should they do a pension or a 401k? I'm going to have, I'm going to debate that at the end. My my argument is a little paternalistic, but that's okay. Y'all can disagree with me on that, but I'll talk about that. 
All right, everybody's good with me so far. The impact on beta, the impact on WAC, the impact on the value of the firm is just not there. Huh? So when you speak about uh, pension funds, I mean, in regards to the uh, managers putting money in the stock, is this a point where it's more political or much like the consulting situation? I also put the money while the market's hot or some reason there. Well, we're going to talk, yeah, why they knew it anyway. We're going to talk about that. Certainly, this took off in the 80s and 90s when the stock market was strong. You know, so part of this is timing. If pension plans have really been strong in the 50s and 60s, and we have the 70s with a horrible stock market, the thought process might have been different. I do think a big part of this, Damien, you're bringing in this term. I do think that's a big part of it. You don't know what that means, inertia? Do y'all think that's possible in finance? It's sophisticated supposed to be that we do things just because that's the way we've always done it. And that gets back to that career risk. How do you keep from getting sued? If you look like everybody else, you're not going to get sued. So that's part of it. There's the inertia, there's habits, there's things we just started doing. It worked really well when they started because the stock market was really strong. And then you had 2000, 2008, you know, you had these big blow ups. So I think inertia is a big part of it. Um, yeah, firms do things. And, and then you have boards that are making decisions that don't really understand this stuff very much. At USA, I saw our board four times a year with some really complicated stuff. And I needed to make a decision. <laughs> I remember I'll probably tell you all this again, but. I went to every board member and presented what we were going to do. Very complicated stuff. They all said, yes, we're fully on board. I then go to the board meeting. They get approval and the CEO goes, do any of y'all understand this? And they all go, no, we don't have, we don't know what he's talking about. He's like, Ron, how could you do this without going and talking to them? I had talked to each one of them individually and they all shook their head. They understood. I had to go and talk to each of them one more time. Um, and the second time, fortunately, the CEO was out. And the board chairman was the president of our life insurance company, a life actuary. And guess what she said? Of course, you're going to do that. That's what you should be doing. So that was the way. So I, I was saved by her being there. I'm sure if she'd gone around and asked them, do you understand this? Most of them, and it's not that they're not, they're, it's not that they're stupid. Right? These are really smart people. But you see something this complex once every three months. You can't blame them for not remembering and understanding. This is really complex. It's, it's some of the frustration in finance is you're dealing with really complex stuff. But board members that don't have that background and you don't get to see them very often, it's it's frustrating. And that's why I, I was asking. Um, one, one moment they're like, yeah, hey, yeah, that's good. And then just, I don't think they even think about it like that. They're just up there shaking their heads and the finest people are talking and it's like, they're not saying that we're doing anything wrong. So uh, I, I spoke to one board. I won't tell you what entity it was. They asked me to come in and present to them. And I pointed out a really serious risk problem they had in their 401k plan that was going to get them in a lot of trouble. And after I presented and the board goes, OK, everybody fine with what we're doing? OK. And they approved. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, why did you have me come talk to you? It's like, they, uh, that's, there's, that's what they want to say. Everything's fine. Don't We don't need to do anything because that's not their job. They're on this board. They just want to get out of there. It's, it's a frustration. Some of you are going to see this with your banks because your bank for paper one, the board is a big part of the process. Who are your board members? Banks are really complicated entities, aren't they? And you got this board that meets once a quarter and they're supposed to be helping you make decisions. It's, you got to think, are we doing this? Is this the right way to make these type of decisions? All right. We already talked about this, pension plan liabilities, but let's go through it again. Make sure you all remember this longevity risk. You're guaranteeing them a payment until they die, just like a life insurance company does. Anti-selection risk, you give them the option between the annuity and lump sum, and the healthy will take the annuity. Um, what would happen if Social Security offered a, a lump sum payment? What percentage do you think would take the lump sum? Probably high percentage. You tell someone, hey, you can have $200,000 a day or $1,000 a month until you die, plus insurance, plus a COLA. Most people say, you said I can get 200. That's all they hear. That's like 200,000 lottery tickets. What are you talking about? Boy, a good chance I could win a billion dollars. Um, so, yeah, it's it's I don't know if anyone has ever done the math. It's so security to do that. They could rig it to save our federal government a lot of money by, by using a really high discount rate. But um, but that is there. You do have that ability to, to have your employees select against you. And then inflation risk is a really tough one. Inflation is a tough thing to manage. Um, and most of these plans have some cost of living adjustment. 
But the main risk we're going to focus in here is on interest rate risk, mainly because it's the easiest one to measure and manage and mitigate. Those other three are, are, are pretty tough. In fact, longevity risk, you know, we don't want to do unless you just hire people to go out and take out your employees. You know, it's, it's a tough thing to manage. So let's talk about interest rate risk. So your discount rate for the pension plan by gap accounting is a current yield. Now, it used to be, this is where the accounting has changed and this is pretty material. So asking why do pension plans do this? I think a big part of this is that the accounting initially encouraged the heavy stock allocation. And then the accounting rules changed and that's when pension plans started. Instead of pension plans saying, hey, the accounting rules have changed, we're exposed to these huge risks we're taking. Maybe we should change how we invest. That's not what they said. Instead, what they said is let's shut down the pension plans and just offer bigger 401k plans, which is not the answer I was hoping for. But gap accounting, they have to use the current yield. Now you can question this discount rate, but the, the original accounting said the discount rate was your expected return on the assets. When your expected return on assets includes 70% in stocks, your discount rate's really high, which makes that liability look really small. So they switched it so you didn't use your expected return on the portfolio, but you had to use investment grade corporate bonds. Laddered out for the for the duration of, of this. So that greatly reduced the discount rate. So pension plan liabilities just must rate really, really high. But should it be investment grade? So what, what can an investment grade corporate investment grade corporate bond do? It can default. And so it has a higher discount rate than treasuries. You know, a corporate bond might be yielding 5% and treasuries might be yielding 4%. And why is there an extra 100 basis points for corporate? Because they can default. Well, can the pension liability default? Should you be using the 100 basis point spread for credit risk or something that doesn't have any credit risk? So I'm in the camp that discount rate should be treasuries. Um, but they went, why did I go to the investment grade? There's the politics. If they go on the treasuries, I was at one conference and they were talking about this and this, the retired CFO of GM, boy, this guy was like, he's retired. I can say anything I want to the rest of my life. I love it. Oh, he was bad mouthing the new gap standards. He was actually expletives in a conference <laughs> speaking. He was so mad that you shouldn't be doing this. Why? Because GM in one day had to write off $16 billion. Uh, because of these accounting changes. You actually, if you, you can actually see it, you go back and look at historical earnings for the S&P, you'll see it drop that one quarter. And that's all because of GM having the write off. He was just livid about it. We shouldn't have to do this. I can't remember his argument, but he, he didn't like it. So I would argue you just almost use treasury rates, but that's what they, that's what they uh, went to. Uh, um, do you think there's also like competition like between firms that offer pension plans or they're like, like some of them might be like happy about this because if they like take on more risk, they'll be able to like make more than their competitors. Well, we're going to talk about that because, um, yeah, there's no benefit to the beneficiary. The person, if, if you do great, that's really another important part here. If you do great in the stock market and you make 12% instead of the six you thought you could make, none of that goes to participants in this plan. So you haven't benefited them at all. So that competition doesn't mean, hey, hey, our principal plan is doing great, come work for us. That's not there at all. Um, now there is competition between pension plans as far as them watching each other. That's the career side of it. It's not the actual beneficiary side. I may tell you some of those stories because we had, we had a heyday in 2008 because so our pension plan kind of did pretty well. Um, all right, so whatever you do, so your discount rate for pension plans, they, they still use the expected return on assets. The most logical to me is use the treasury yield because your liability is, is a liability. I mean, it's, and actually what you probably should use is the tips plus some inflation because you know this has a COLA in it. Um, that makes the most sense. But a lot of states refuse to go to the new accounting. Why? Because the states are already bankrupt. And they're bankrupt even when they're lying about their, their pension plan. The last thing they want to do is tell the truth. And this would be this would be devastating. I don't know what. Well, actually, I can show you. Web, there's websites that will actually show you California's pension plans under these different assumptions. And it's 
pretty shocking, the billions and billions of dollars that is not being reported to their taxpayers. <laughs> all right, so all three approaches are tied to current interest rates, even the expected return on assets. They're all tied to interest rates. When interest rates fall, discount rates fall, the liability mushrooms. And pension plans are very long duration, extremely sensitive. So the typical bond portfolio has a duration of about five years. If you're investing in like the Maryland's aggregate, about five year duration. We consider a long duration to be eight to nine years. That's a, that's a very aggressive portfolio. Pension plan durations can be 20 plus years. Twice as interest rate sensitive as the typical, as any, any reasonable bond investor. That's why I say it has such a huge impact on your beta. When rates fall, lab, pension liabilities rise, not a little bit, but a whole lot. When rates rise, they fall, but it is not symmetrical. They rise a whole lot more than they fall for the same change in interest rates. So it's, it's a skewed to the negative. The liability rises by a much greater amount for a given bond. We'll actually show that. That's the positive convexity. Some of y'all took my investment class and you thought, well, I thought positive convexity is good. It is on investments, but we're not talking about investments. We're talking about the liability. Positive convexity on liability, this is very positively convex, is not a good thing when the liability, you wish the liability was negative, negatively convex. You'd like for it to do really horribly when, when rates rise and not, not, not rise as much when rates fall. So, um, so significant positive convexity. Now, some of y'all may not have had that term. Do y'all know convexity? I ask some of y'all that have my class last semester, do y'all remember it? Convexity, we just talked about it in Carlos's and Wayland's class. Yes, yeah, so convexity. Y'all feel comfortable with convexities? Some of y'all have never heard convexity before, maybe. So it's it's an important term. It's usually not covered undergraduate. I think it's important to cover because of things like this. It really is really critical. Life insurance companies have the exact same problem. Their liabilities are positively convex, and it causes it makes it really difficult to manage the risk. All right, so this let's look at this slide. I'm going to, I want to, all right, we'll do it. We'll just have Zoom come back. So this is the slide I said you should be able to sit down in a blank Excel sheet and build this in like three minutes, all right? This is something to be really second nature to. I'll show you uh, r knots approach, and I think you'll find this is a much simpler way to do it. So let's take a pension plan that only has two cash flows. I don't know why. Maybe there's two employees, their monthly income is $500 and they die right after the first month. Perfect. Somehow, I don't know, just to keep it simple. So one employee is gonna get $500 in three years and another employee is gonna get $500 in 30 years. So your cash flows are 50-50. And then you discount it. 500 discounted at 7%. Y'all know how to do that. So 500 divided by what? You are quiet because you're 98.7% sure that you're right, but that one point something percent would be so embarrassing if you're wrong. Is that is that the thought process? 500 divided by 1.07 to the third power. Does that seem right? President, I think this is what you do as a finance major or an actuarial science major. 500 divided by 1.07 raised to the third power. Everybody agree that that's 408? Y'all can do it on your calculators and test it. What about 500 for the 30 year? What is the 66? 500, 30th power. So while it's 50 50 on the cash flows, the liability is 86%. The near term cash flow is only 14%, the far out cash flow. However, what happens if interest rates fall from seven to five? So this liability goes to 432. You may want to guess how I got that. <laughs> 500 divided by 105 to the third. This one goes to 106. 500 divided by 105 to the 30th. The change in the liability, this liability went up 24. This liability went up 50. So while this liability is only 14% of the liability, it is 
76% of the change in liability. When interest rates change, most of your change in liability is going to come from those long-term cash flows. Why? Because of duration and convexity. That super convexity is going to hit there. Um, so I'm sorry, the seven, I'm sorry, 68%. So this liability went up 6%. This liability went up 76%. So this 30 year was two thirds of the volatility of this pension plan. Okay. So what does this mean? So this is Robert Arnott's argument. His argument is you don't have to do what Professor Sweet's saying, not that he knows, but he has met me twice, but he would not remember me from anybody. But you don't have to do what Professor Sweet's doing. It's much simpler than that. Most of your volatility is coming from this small part of your liability. All you really need to do is just hedge this. And when you hedge this, how much of your interest rate risk do you eliminate? Two thirds of it. You can see his argument. Just get rid of that part of the interest rate risk and manage your pension plan the way you've always managed it everywhere else. And you've eliminated a huge chunk of your, your life. And I agree with that argument. I'm just like, why not go another step and get rid of all the risk? But that was his argument. So extremely important. The 30 year is a small part of the liability, but it's two thirds of the volatility of the liability. So small part of the liability, but a big part of the, the volatility. Uh -huh. um, can you like, explain again his argument on how to well, the easiest thing would be a swap. You could do an interest rate swap that will exactly go up 50 million if interest rates fall from seven to five. And what happens if you have a swap that's going to make 50 million? Then you lose 50 million dollars here, you make 50 million on the swap. And that's exactly what we did at USA. You just buy a swap that has the exact same duration and as this 30 year and the same notional, remember the notional is 66 million. So you do a swap at 66 million has the same duration and convexity as that liability. And when rates fall, that swap's gonna go up the exact same amount as that liability and it's completely wiped out. Remember on the banks, we said the swap is on the liability side, but with pension plans, we think of the swap on the asset side. Other questions on this? I love this because I, you know, I think it just so simplifies it. I know the pension plan doesn't make any sense, but you don't need what, what, what uh, Arnott does is he has 70 years of cash flows. So he does this, but he does it for 70 years. And it's really hard to look at because it's this massive graph. So all I did is I took his 70 years and I just made it two years doing the exact same thing he's doing. All right. So questions on that. This is really, really key he's to his argument. You can eliminate a lot of risk by just taking advantage. You're really taking advantage of the extreme duration of this long liability because that keeps it a small percentage of the liability. So you don't have to do much to eliminate a lot of risk. And that's that's pretty powerful. So he's saying at least do that, at least get rid of that piece. We'll talk about what that does to the value of the firm. So what about my solution? My solution is kill Kill the volatility in dark, completely get rid of it. Immunization. <clears throat> so life insurance actuary, I already told you this story, similar liabilities, radically different investment strategies. They, they assess the liabilities and they're very, very, very good at this. It's just amazing. They do what's called key rate duration. You can look at key rate durations. So they're matching duration and convexity at every bucket of cash flow in an amazing, amazing way. Very, very sophisticated. I, th I think USA might have been the best in the business in doing that. Um, there, were two, there were two Johns. John was the actuary and then John was the portfolio manager. And the two of them worked so closely together. So John, the investment portfolio manager, he would talk to the actuary and say, what bonds do we need? And he says, well, I really need some six, six year duration bucketing that fill that up. Uh, and I need this kind of convexity and the investing John says, well, I can get you seven with this convexity. He says, well, can you do this much of seven, this much of five? That's the kind of discussions they were having. Try to get it precisely. It was just an amazing. And why do you have to do that? Well, because you have a firm that has $20 billion in assets and only, you know, a billion and a half, two billion in net worth. They didn't have much room for error. They have to get that exactly precise. So it was pretty amazing. Not all life insurance companies are like that. I know because I interviewed with the life insurance company. 
they wanted me on the investment side to do interest rate modeling. And I was interviewing and asking about their life actuaries and they'd never met their life actuary. No one in the investment side had ever talked to life actuary. And so I came to the last interview, which was the CEO. He goes, oh, you're Ron Sweet. Yeah, I saw your resume. I knew we'd never hire you. That was the first thing he said to me. So I let him have it about how bad I thought his firm was since I wasted, he wasted a trip to Chicago for nothing. So, but anyway, I was kind of livid after that. But yeah, I was kind of shocked. Here you have a life insurance company, an investment firm managing all these assets, not talking to the actuaries at all. That makes no sense to me at all. But that's what USA did. Just incredible precision, careful as careful as they could be to manage these risks. All right, so interest rate risk, the most straightforward, longevity risk, anti-selective risk, really hard to manage those in the capital markets. Inflation, there are instruments to hedge inflation. Um, I put out on WhatsApp for the Investment Society, tips would have, you would have thought if you bought tips at the beginning of last year, you would have done really well, wouldn't you? These inflation index bonds at a year when inflation took off, but tips were down 12% last year. So, you know, how do you hedge inflation? Now there, there are inflation uh, derivatives. We looked at them at, when we were at USA, essentially CPI swaps. So if you think about it, you pay LIBOR or whatever it is, so what is it? Y'all remember what it is? So, so food? There's an F in there somewhere, isn't there? But anyway, whatever is the new new thing. So you pay that and you receive, receive inflation. That would be a really good instrument. But the problem is there's not enough. There's not enough of size and volume to be able to handle a $3 billion pension plan. So, but that would be great. Maybe over time we get more inflation products. The problem we have with inflation is... There's a lot of people worried about inflation rising, but there aren't a lot of people worried about inflation falling. For a hedge to work, you need hedgers on both sides. So we we don't know those people. Now governments, governments worry about inflation being low because you know they, they make more in taxes than rates, interest rates when inflation rises, but it's hard to find a natural hedger on the other side. So they just have not taken off very well. Um, on the longevity risk, I had an actuary approach me. And this was his argument. You can kind of assess this. I, I, I thought about it, but he said, okay, Ron, you got a pension plan on our employees that you got to pay until they die. I got group life on our employees that we got to pay them when they die. You want them to die as fast as possible. I want them to live as long as possible. Why don't we just hedge each other? So if they live incredibly long, I pay you money. If they die incredibly fast, you pay me money. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting, but there was one serious problem with that. He was insuring current employees, and I was giving him a pension plan to former employee. You know, the, the group of employees was not the same group. Maybe there's some correlation. If suddenly USA's retirees started dying, maybe the employees started dying as well. But I don't think the relationship. But I thought it was interesting to do. Can you find a hedge for longevity? Could IBM and USA get together and say, hey? You're worried about people living too long, worried about them dying too fast. Let's let's just work with each other. I don't think I think the basis risk would just be too high because you just can't get the same people in the group. That's that's pretty tough to do. Anti-selection, I just think firms have just said, we'll do whatever the employees say. There's not really a good way to hedge that. So it's it's tough. So interest rates, the one we can hedge, but it's the most noticeable one as well. It's the one that flows through as fast. So if you eliminate that one, management will notice it. These other ones tend to be slow discoveries over time. Uh, they are risk and they are important, but they're they're not quite as dramatic. All right, so the hedge interest rate risk, we're talking about a very, very long duration liability. There are no bonds to buy. There are no 20 duration year duration bonds out there. And we need positive convexity. What we need does not exist really be nice if we had something where like we could swap interest rates with each other and create duration. Anything you can think of that might do that? Like maybe we could call it an interest rate swap. Does that sound like that could work? What do your interest rate swaps do? They allow you to buy duration in a nanosecond. If you need 30 years of duration, you can do it in one phone call just like that. An incredible, incredible thing. So interest rate swaps, dollar duration gap, 
It's exactly what we started doing at USAA. Um, and, and literally, it was, well, it was a 10 minute call because the guy kept talking, but it, very, very quick. This is very, it's a, you may not think swaps is a liquid market, but it's actually pretty, pretty liquid market. Uh, they can set these things. The brokers, I'm not ex exactly sure what the investment banks are doing on their side of the deal, but you call them and say, I need $3 billion. They'll give you $3 billion on the call and hang up and you're done. I mean, it's 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 there. I don't know how it's it's so magically fast on their side. I'm, some of y'all may work in that side and come back and, and educate me on what's going on over there. You're probably going to come back and say, boy, they were really ripping you off. You should see what they're doing. And I'm sure they're probably making making some easy money on the other side, but it's nice to be able to pick up the phone and say, "Hey, I need I need 20 more years of duration." It's like, "Yeah, here you go." All right, thanks. I got to be at lunch in two minutes. Okay, you're you're good. You can go. I mean, it's it's an amazing thing. Yeah, uh, Warren Buffett talks about derivatives being these you know these these nuclear bombs that are just going to blow up the whole U.S. economy, but that's true if they're using correctly, but you see when they're used correctly, they're amazingly powerful things that we can't accomplish. We can't accomplish certain things without them. They're all we, we've got. So hedging with interest rates. All right. So should pension plans do this? All right, you're gonna get my argument. I don't know where we are on time. Can y'all stay till midnight? Is that all right? Yeah. I can't. I don't know why UTSA doesn't like clocks. Um, all right, so should pension plans do what I'm recommending or even advocating for? Remember, I talked to the guy from AT&T and he laughed at me. He thought I was an idiot. So here's my argument. Don't you wish you were here so you could debate it in public? Um, so first of all, federal law requires every decision you make for a pension plan must be solely, that word solely is actually in the law, solely in the best interest of plan participants. It can't be done for the corporation, can't be done for the politics or the board. You can only have one decision criteria that every decision you make has to help participants, all right? Let's start with that. That gets kind of to your <laughs> question. This is a fiduciary requirement, which means if I don't meet my fiduciary requirement, I can, I can be sued for millions if not billions of dollars. I'm on the hook for this plan. If I make decisions that destroy this plan, all the employees on this plan can sue me personally as a fiduciary for the plan. I'm gonna argue that argues that you should hedge. So the Vicky's point, if I put it in stocks, the stock market does really great. What does that do for the plan participants? Absolutely nothing. Their payout is set by contract based on years of service and certain things. The employer doesn't come in and say, hey, our plan's doing really well. We're going to kick in some more benefits. No, that doesn't happen. It'd be too complicated. you got too many retirees out there. What if the stock market crashes and the plan goes to fault? What does that do for participants? That's going to kill them, right? They lose their, their plan. So what does investing in the stock market do for plan participants? Pure risk. No upside, all downside. There is no benefit to plan participants when you invest in the stock market. A heavy allocation of stocks also goes to the taxpayer because when pension plans crash, there's a federal agency, the PBGC, that bails these pension plans, not 100%. So if you're a participant, you won't get your entire pension plan, but you'll get some of it. So we as taxpayers bear the brunt. Who wins if the stock market does really well? So AT&T puts all the money in the stock market, stock market's up a bunch. Who wins that? AT&T, and how do they win? They can't take that money out, but it reduces how much they have to contribute to the plan going forward. Now, here's the argument I tried on a lawyer. I said, okay, well, can I argue to invest in stocks? Because if I invest in stocks and the stock market does really well, it makes this pension plan much less expensive than USAA and makes it much more likely USAA will offer the pension plan and that helps the beneficiary. And he said, no, you can't make that argument. So, okay, well, that's right. <laughs> but that's kind of my kind of the back door or say, hey, it kind of indirectly says, no, you can't, every decision has to be solely in the best interest of plan participants. And the fact that the majority of that benefit's going to your employer, it just happens, you know, help the employee a little bit. That's just not, it's gotta be, so that word solely is a pretty rough word. So if it if it's 50, 50, if it's 99% participant and 1% employer, that's not solely. Solely implies what? 
100.00000%. So I believe firms that place significant amounts into the, into the stocks are violating their producer responsibility. I use this a lot at USA. This was kind of my almost my wild card. Anytime a boss says, oh, I don't know if I'm gonna do that. I say, well, I just told you about it. So now you know you have a producer responsibility. So just letting you know I'm I'm giving you, you know, political uh, legal jeopardy. So sorry I brought this up because you don't want to do it. But um, but yeah, I mean, we have a producer responsibility. We need to act in the best interest of the beneficiaries. The best interest of pension plan participants is the what? To maximize the probability that they're going to pay what they promised the employee. That's the most important thing for them to do. Balancing immunization does exactly. Hey. So HUD gives their partners like pieces of their stock. Like kind of like as part of their pension plan, how does that? Be? Well, that's a profit sharing plan. It's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. You can argue if that's the best way to do it as well. Uh, this is not a profit sharing plan. This is a defined benefit, so it's a little bit different. So yeah, that's a different plan. And the employees know going in that they're taking the risk for each of these operations are, but it's a very different, very different thing. They could shift that to a defined benefit plan if they wanted to, or they could shut down the defined benefit plan and put it into that project. But if they have a defined benefit plan, these are the rules for that. All right. So, you know, I'm, I'm saying this is what ERISA says are the rules for pension plans. All right. So, oh man, do we have time? All right. This part I really love. Um, I had my first boss in finance, but my first boss's boss in finance, uh, I had him come talk to this class twice. He was so over the heads of the class and over mine as well. He was talking about utilities and managing utility risk, and he was using so much jargon, he didn't realize how hard it was to follow. Uh, we don't realize we use jargon because I had lunch with him and I was talking about what I was doing at USA. He couldn't follow me. I'm thinking he was a PhD in economics. So, you know, we get so specialized in our little worlds that we think these words we're using mean something to anyone outside of our little, you know, cubbyhole. So, um, but he did say one thing in that class that I you got to remember, and it's extremely important. There are two ways to increase the value of the firm. He says most finance people forget the second. So how do you increase the value of the firm? You increase free cash flows. That means doing positive net present value projects. But what's the second way you increase the value of the firm? Reduce the whack. And he says most people in finance forget that second one is out there. So I'm going to argue that immunizing a pension plan does nothing to value. Why? Because you're buying bonds. What's the net present value of buying bonds? Zero. So you're doing nothing to value, but what are you doing to risk? Significantly reducing. And so I'm going to argue that immunizing a pension plan increases the value of the firm because you're, you greatly reduce their whack. In 2008, great example. Pension plans blew up in 2008, right when the stock market was blowing up. So it's a bad time. I'm really glad our pension plan didn't do that because we had a new CEO. And the last thing I'd want to do is go, okay, uh, Joe, you know how bad everything is? Well, um, our pension plan's down a billion dollars too. So you might want to, you know, just letting you know, it's good to see you in the hall. Yeah, I'm glad we didn't have, I'm glad we hedged that. It, it was one major risk he didn't have, he didn't have to worry about. Um, I'll talk about the other side of the argument here. And some of y'all are probably thinking that argument. We'll probably do it next class. I'll let you stew on it over the weekend. Do you, does this make sense to y'all? I would bring this up in an interview if I were you. Because this is something, why did Valero sell Cornerstone store? Probably reduce the whack of Valero. So there are firms that do make major decisions entirely to reduce the whack of the firm. All right? All right, someone disagrees with me. Um, is that going to be a fire drill? Um, questions on that? Does that make sense to you? All right, so um, I think I just I just said that already. So balance sheet immunization, life insurance companies all do this. No one would buy invest in a life insurance company if it was seventy percent stocks. It would just be such a crazy investment, It'd just be ridiculous. And life insurance companies has that risk because their stockholders don't want that kind of risk. All right, so next class, what we're going to do is say, well. If theory so clearly says you should immunize, why do most pension plans not do that? Let's see if we can give them an excuse. Let me throw out the one that at and guy is going to say. 
But Ron, yeah, the market crashed in 2008, but it's up a bunch since then. You gave up all this value. You could have been in stocks all that time. All right, so I'm going to I'm gonna use that argument. I'm going to show you the illogical conclusion of that argument next class.